Good morning students. Today we will discuss about oral epithelial tumors part 2. Last week we had discussed about the oral epithelial benign tumors and the viral etiology related to them. We had also discussed about oral submucous fibrosis and melanoma. Today in this part we will discuss the etiopathic of oral squamous cell carcinoma. So at the end of the topic, we should be able to describe in detail the etiology and molecular pathogenesis aspects of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Last week I had discussed in brief the risk factors associated with oral squamous cell carcinoma. Today I am going to discuss this topic in detail. Oral squamous cell carcinoma as we all know is an invasive epithelial neoplasm. This shows varying degrees of differentiation. This can be observed histopathologically under a microscope. Oral squamous cell carcinoma has a propensity to show early and extensive lymph node metastasis. Oral squamous cell carcinoma occurs predominantly in alcohol and tobacco users and the incidence is generally seen in the fifth and sixth decades of life. Oral squamous cell carcinoma is commonly referred to as oral cancer but this makes up 90% of all the oral malignancies which we know which we also know as oral cancer. The other malignancies which can be related to the oral cavity include varicose carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma and other connective tissue malignancies such as fibrosarcoma and osteosarcoma. So a point to remember here is that all these malignancies can be referred to as oral cancer. However, oral squamous cell carcinoma makes up 90% of all the oral malignancies. The oral squamous cell carcinoma can occur in any part of the oral cavity. It can occur in relation to the tongue, to the buccal mucosa, to the buccal, uh, to the buccal vestibule and to the labial mucosa. Rarely it can occur in the palate or other region as well. These variations are related to the etiological cause and geographical variations have also been noted. Globally, oral squamous cell carcinoma has been pre predominantly encountered in the men. However, in Malaysia, the oral cancer prevalency is seen in Indian ethnic females. As we all know, tobacco is the prime etiological factor for the development of oral cancer or oral squamous cell carcinoma. However, we should know that the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma shows a multifactorial etiology. Another point to note here is that most of the cases of oral squamous cell carcinoma are detected at a later stage. According to findings, it has been found that only 35.4% of the cases are diagnosed at an earlier stage, that is stage 1 and stage 2. When the oral squamous cell carcinoma is detected at an early stage, it leads to a better prognosis or good prognosis. Here is an extract from a study conducted in Malaysia. These findings have been published in the website of University of Malaya. So this study includes a total of 353 cases of oral squamous cell carcinoma wherein it was found that the incidence among male and female patients are similar. However, as you can see that there is a slight increase in incidence 51.6% in females. Seeing the ethnic variation of the distribution of oral squamous cell carcinoma it can be clearly seen that the highest incidence is seen among the females of Indian ethnic origin. The distribution of oral squamous cell carcinoma also varies according to the location within the oral cavity. It can be seen that among the males, the tongue is the most common location, whereas among the females, the floor of the mouth is the most common location. The students are advised to review a few studies which have been conducted within Malaysia 
which shows the epidemiological status of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Here are two examples of such studies. The students are advised to look into such studies and understand this topic better. Now coming to the risk factors of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Various risk factors have been implicated with the development of oral cancer. This can be lifestyle induced, related to ionizing radiations, viruses, presence of chronic infections, chronic immunocompromised states also predisposed to the development of cancer and in certain situations the development of oral cancer have a genetic tendency. However, it has to be noted that lifestyle is by far the most significant and most common factor associated with the development of oral cancer. To summarize, it can be said that oral cancer, the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma has a multifactorial etiology. As we have already discussed that lifestyle is a significant factor in the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. This is related to the habit of smoking tobacco. It has been found that smoking actively or passive smoking increases the chances of cancer. Tobacco worldwide is consumed in mainly two forms. It is, it is either smoked or consumed in a smokeless form. It is well known that tobacco smoking generates various compounds. Numerous studies conducted worldwide have concluded that there are nearly 70 known carcinogenic compounds which are produced as a result of tobacco smoke. In the right side of this picture you can see the various components which have been created in the tobacco smoke. The nicotine which is the principal component of the tobacco basically has an addictive property. Cigarettes when smoked also leads to the development of various carcinogenic compounds. The most significant of these are tobacco specific nitrosamines. Other carcinogens which have been developed as a result of tobacco smoking includes benzene, aromatic amines, acetaldehyde, polyaromatics etc. The students are advised to make a list of these tobacco specific uh, carcinogens in relation to the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. So to summarize here, tobacco smoking in the form of cigarettes or cigars, beads or pipes relates to the development of carcinogens. The most significant of these that is tobacco specific nitrosamines results in the development of free radicals within the tissues. These free radicals leads to the alteration of antioxidant enzymes resulting in the development of dysplastic features within the cells which ultimately leads to the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. It has to be noted here that there is a strong dose response relationship between tobacco and the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Numerous studies conducted worldwide have shown that a person with an increased frequency and duration of tobacco habit is at a higher risk of development of squamous cell carcinoma as compared to a person with a lower frequency or a person who does not display the tobacco habit as at all. So, for example, a person who smokes 15 to 20 cigarettes a day for 10 to 15 years is at a higher risk to a person who smokes less than 10 cigarettes per day and has been having this habit for a couple of years only. However, the point to note here is a non-smoker has a very low chance of developing oral squamous cell carcinoma in comparison to a smoker. Not only tobacco smoking can be harmful for the oral tissues, tobacco when consumed in the smokeless form 
has equally been found to be carcinogenic in nature. Smokeless tobacco has been predominantly used in three forms. It is either chewed or plugged or it is inhaled as a form of snuff. Betel quid is an important etiological factor or a component in the development of oral cancers. The picture on the right shows a betel quid. This is nothing but a preparation which uses betel leaf, areca nut, slake lime, tobacco, catechu, spices and sweeteners. The habit of consuming betel quid is predominantly in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Consequently, the incidence of oral cancers related to the betel quid chewing habit has been found to be more in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Slake lime is an important constituent of betel quid. This slake lime results in the formation of reactive oxygen species. Also, the nitrosation, the nitrosation of erica alkaloids results in the formation of erica nut specific nitrosamines which have been known to have a mutagenic or toxic effect on the oral epithelial cells. Ultimately, this results in the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Slake lime has been found to be a, an increased, or show an increased susceptibility to other ingredients of the betel quid. Alcohol produces acetaldehyde on consumption which is known to be a, a suspected carcinogen. A point to remember here is that the habit of alcohol consumption as smoking produces a multiplicative risk to the development of cancer. This has been referred to as the synergistic effect of tobacco and alcohol consumption. So a person who consumes alcohol has an increased acetaldehyde burden. This results in the activation of procarcinogens. Also the alcohol consumption increases the diffusibility of the mucosal surface. This results in increased susceptibility of the carcinogens re, re, uh, formed as a result of tobacco smoking to the oral epithelial cells. Diet. Now diet also plays an essential role in the protective effect of the oral mucosa. Diets which are deficient in essential nutrients may predispose to the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Various epidemiological studies have shown that people showing deficiency of various nutrient components have shown an increased association of oral squamous cell carcinoma. It has been found that diets which are rich in fruit or vegetables have a protective effect. This is related to the normal epithelial maturation of the oral mucosa which requires various nutrients. Also, such diets are rich in dietary antioxidants. These form a protective mechanism and protects the oral mucosa by diffusing the free radicals which have known to cause a dysplastic effect on the oral epithelial cells. Other dietary components include mild iron deficiency, low glutathione levels. These also have been known to increase the oxidative stress on the oral epithelial cells. Studies have also shown that diet which are rich, rich in vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A and carotenoids show a disc, decreased risk of oral squamous cell carcinoma. All these vitamins have shown to have an antioxidant effect and neutralize the free radicals and prevent the deleterious effects on the oral epithelial cells. An example of dietary deficiency is a condition called plummer winsel syndrome or patterson kelly syndrome. This syndrome shows a deficiency in iron levels. 
plumber vention or Patterson Kelly syndrome has been shown to be associated commonly with the oropharyngeal carcinoma. Other factors related to the development of oral cancer or oral squamous cell carcinoma include viruses. Two viruses have been commonly implicated in the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. These include human papilloma virus and Epstein Barr virus. Human papilloma virus is commonly isolated in cases of verrucous carcinoma, whereas Epstein Barr virus is commonly isolated in cases of nasopharyngeal carcinoma and a few lymphomas like Bucket's lymphoma. It has also been found that poor oral health to show a association with oral squamous cell carcinoma. Poor oral health leads to deterioration of the periodontal condition. The polymicrobial supragingival plaque causes a mutagenic interaction with the saliva, resulting in damage to the oral epithelial cells. The immune status of an individual is also been known to be associated with the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. People with reduced immune status or immunocompromised states are at a risk of development of oral cancers. Superficially, I'm sorry. So this is the oral keratinocyte. Upon mature, upon cell division, one cell continues within the basal cell layer, and the other cell migrates superficially, undergoing maturation. This process is conducted by the cell cycle, wherein the cell undergoes division, following which there is maturation. So under normal circumstances, various factors are there which keeps these processes of cell division under check such that only optimum number of cells are present within the oral mucosa. However, exposure to various carcinogens results in genetic damage to this oral keratinocytes. The process of cell cycle or cell division is disturbed, dysregulated resulting in excessive uncoordinated proliferation of cells such that it results in a growth as well as invasion into the underlying connective tissue which results in malignancy. So to understand the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma we have to understand the basic process of cell cycle. The process of cell cycle is divided into various phases. A divided cell, as I mentioned, a cell will undergo cell division to form two cells, two daughter cells. One cell continues as the progenitor cell, while as the other undergoes maturation to the superficial cell layer. So, immediately after cell division, there will be a, a gap phase. This is known as the G1 phase. At certain times, the cells will undergo a resting phase that is the G0 phase. So before a cell has to divide, it has to move into the next phase that is the S phase or synthesis phase. So the transition of the cell or the movement of the cell into the synthesis phase is controlled by a gate. The cell passes into the synthesis phase after the cell is checked for size, adequacy of size, presence of nutrients, presence of growth factors, and the pre uh, presence of undamaged DNA. The next stage after synthesis of the DNA is the second gap phase which is the G2 phase. At this phase the nuclear component of the cell is complete, it's reduplicated and the cell is ready for division. The movement of this cell to the next phase also is checked by a gate wherein improperly formed cells are removed or prevented from undergoing the cell cycle. Just before the beginning of mitosis, a third gate point is there, a checkpoint is there to control the proper cells from undergoing cell division. So under normal uh, circumstances, various checkpoints have been kept in place to ensure that 
the cell which undergoes cell division is normal and does not show any does not show any dysplastic features so to understand the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma it is safe to say that this cell cycle is disturbed or dysregulated that means the checkpoints which have been placed to control normal proliferation is disturbed three genes have been associated with maintaining this normalcy these are tumor suppressor genes dna repair genes proto oncogenes and oncogenes normally the, uh, the cell expresses a gene called tumor suppressor genes these genes function by keeping a check on uncoordinated proliferation of cells an example of a tumor suppressor gene is p53 gene p53 gene is seen in most of the cells somatic cells and prevents the uncoordinated proliferation of cells other example of tumor suppressor gene is retinoblastoma gene normal cells also express certain dna repair genes these genes will detect any irregularities in the dna content nucleic acid content of the cell and repairs the cells before it goes into the next phase of mitosis or of cell cycle in addition there are a group of genes called proto oncogenes and oncogenes proto oncogenes are genes which stimulate the controlled proliferation of cells mutation of these proto oncogenes results in what is known as the oncogenes oncogenes results in uncontrolled or uncoordinated proliferation of cells so it can be assumed that in cases of oral squamous cell carcinoma there are genetic mutations which are basically targeting these three group of genes the tumor suppressor genes when mutated is no longer able to keep a check on the uncontrolled proliferation of cells defects in the dna repair genes results in cells with improper genetic material moving to the next phase of the cell cycle defect in the balance of proto oncogenes and oncogenes results in an increased number of oncogenes which results in uncoordinated or uncontrolled proliferation of cells so to come back to the cell cycle the various gates which kept a check on the proliferation of cells are hampered as a result of genetic defect including the three main genes which results in uncontrolled and uncoordinated growth of cells resulting to the development of oral cancer the pathogenesis of oral squamous cell carcinoma can further be explained by the following events development of oral squamous cell carcinoma is not just a single genetic mutation it is basically a progressive accumulation of a number of genetic alterations within the oral epithelial cells these genetic alterations occurs at different times leading to a gradual progression of the cells into invasive carcinoma the image below as you can see shows the gradual progression of a normal appearing epithelium to hyperplasia further into mild dysplasia further developing into severe dysplasia or carcinoma in situ and finally developing a full invasive carcinoma various genetic alterations have been known to lead to this development of oral squamous cell carcinoma the chief genetic alteration includes or involves a loss of chromosomal material from a specific area within the chromosome this process is known as loss of heterozygosity loss of heterozygosity is an important event genetic event in the transformation of oral squamous cell carcinoma a molecular model of carcinogenesis has been proposed which describe the various events or genetic events 
which leads to the stepwise formation of oral squamous form cell carcinoma. The various genetic events have been mapped to individual stages of the epithelial transformation. The molecular model of carcinogenesis is an important topic and it is advised that all the students know this topic thoroughly, including the each step and the genetic mutations associated. So according to this molecular model of pathogenesis, the normal mucosa shows loss of heterozygosity at the short arm of chromosome 9. This genetic mutation leads to the normal mucosa being converted to a predisplastic lesion. Loss of heterozygosity involving the short arm of chromosome P and loss of heterozygosity involving the short arm of chromosome 17 results in dysplasia. The, the chromosome 17 is resulted to the is related to the p53 protein so any genetic defect involving the short arm of chromosome 17 results to the mutation of p53 gene these events lead or alter the predisplastic mucosa into a dysplastic mucosa dysplasia is considered as a potentially malignant oral disorder which can be seen as leukoplakia or other conditions clinically. Further genetic events are seen in a dysplastic lesion which results in a more severe form of dysplasia also known as carcinoma in situ. So genetic defects are seen in the long arm of chromosome 11, long arm of chromosome 13 and long arm of chromosome 14. All these genetic mutations results in the development of carcinoma in situ. Further, loss of heterozygosity is seen in the short arm of chromosome 6, chromosome 8 and the long arm of chromosome 4 which results in the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. So this illustration and description is important to know or a must know topic for all the students. So to summarize here, the P53 protein is coded at the short arm of, pro of chromosome 17 and it functions as a regulator of the cell cycle. So any genetic defect at this P53 or at this 17, uh, law, uh, short arm of 17 chromosome results in dysregulation of P53 protein. The normal P53 protein detects damage and arrest cell cycle. Mutation of this P53 protein leads to a loss of regulation of the checkpoint allowing cells and damaged DNA to undergo replication leading to the development of cancer. Thus, mutation of P53 is a common and significant event in the oral cancer and many other cancers in the body. So to summarize for today's topic, can be said that oral squamous cell carcinoma has a multifactorial etiology. Tobacco is the most recognized etiological factor in the development of oral squamous cell carcinoma. Numerous carcinogens or factors have been described which cause genetic alteration within the cells. These genetic alterations cause defect in the cell cycle leading to the development of cancer. Development of oral cancer is a multi-step process. Understanding this process is vital to understand the disease and its prognosis. Loss of heterozygosity and mutation of P53 gene are the two significant events associated with oral cancer. The molecular mechanism or of progression of oral skull carcinoma is to be understood thoroughly to understand the pathogenesis of oral squamous cell carcinoma. So before I conclude, I want to remind three steps given by the Ministry of Health Malaysia to 
fight this coronavirus infection. I request all to stay at home and stay safe. Thank you for today's lecture. I request the students to observe the assignment given on Google Classroom and write their, uh, write their findings or notes in the in the in the area provided thank you for the patient listening